So let's begin then, I think we need to pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to study your word. May your name be glorified in our lives this week as we go about our daily lives living it for you. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning it is about the cross, but possibly in a slightly different way from what we were seeing. Take up the cross and follow him daily. And the emphasis is on the word daily. I probably mentioned I like to do Bible study words just based on a word. Don't look up God unless you want to be there for a long time. Yeah. Daily, a divine principle and practice in creation. I don't think there would have been anything before creation about daily because it was eternity and I simply cannot fundamentally understand it. I can sort of understand eternity to come, but not eternity past. But for three days there was night and there was day and there was no sun and there was no moon. The glory of the Lord was in its light. And it was as if God pressed one of those dimmer switches so Adam and Eve could go to sleep at night time. Yeah. Well, that's my thoughts. I've got to get away from my thoughts at night. Then God created the sun and the moon for day. And you know, in eternity there'll be no sun and there'll be no moon. Why? Because in eternity to come, the glory of the Lord and the light of the Lamb will illuminate heaven. God dwells an unapproachable light. But we will have a body like unto Christ's glorious body. So that would be no problem. A few verses from the Old Testament, Isaiah 58, 2. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness, and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They take delight in approaching God. How often? Daily. Proverbs 8, 32. Now therefore listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not disdain it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favour from the Lord. A beautiful passage. Israel as a nation, of course, did not always live up to that, and neither do we. Psalm 72, 15, and he shall live in the gold of sheep and will be given to him. Prayer also will be made for him continually. And daily he shall be praised. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. That is a messianic psalm that speaks about the kingdom reign of Christ on the earth. Apparently, if you look around the world, you'll find that the whole earth is not filled with his glory. But the day is coming when it will be when he returns and rules in absolute righteousness. Exodus 16 is very well known about the manna coming down from heaven. How often? Daily. You know, God created the world in six days. He could have done it in six seconds at the greatest of these. But he put this into practice for our, put it into practice that way, put it into creation that way so that we might have this daily experience. Provision from God daily took course on the day before the Sabbath when they were to take out two lots. Then in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. Why not make me a millionaire, Lord, and I won't bother you again, is my usual comment on that. But God's purpose and plan for mankind in the Garden of Eden on was to have communion and fellowship. He walked in the garden in the cool of the evening, the end of his creation, Adam and Eve. And it's not only daily bread. It's about all our physical and spiritual provisions can refer just as good parents provide not only what their children need for physical life but also practical 
also emotional and relational needs. So we are to come to God daily, at least daily. There's nothing wrong with coming more than once, as we'll see at the close. But then at the end of that Lord's Prayer it says, verse 33, But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you daily. The life of the daily being. God has already met our greatest spiritual need, and that is the forgiveness of sins and restoration through Jesus Christ, as we've been remembering. But He doesn't stop there. Jesus calls Himself the bread of life. And in that light was the light of the world, as we've been looking at this morning. Thanks, King. Jesus said He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Not only will we save for eternity, but also experience a restored relationship with God. We seek Him daily and He renews us day by day. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. In the last couple of weeks I could have done a bit, with a bit of the exterior man being renewed as well. But it wasn't to be. But there is a wonderful joy in being renewed by God in that spiritual life, communion and fellowship that we share together. Right, thank you Linda. Could we have Luke 9 verse 23 to 7, 27. The main verse I want to focus on is verse 23. We'll pop up in a minute. There it is. Then he said to them all, Anyone who desires to come after me, let him three things deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, I think the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. That last verse there I'm not going to go into, there's a number of explanations for that. One simply is the transfiguration of Christ just a few days later. Some of the disciples saw him in all his kingdom, glory and splendor. Now there's quite a few different explanations and time doesn't permit. This verse is all about the Jewish people who were around about Jesus as he talked to them at the time. He asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Who do you say? And he spoke about the fact that he was going to die. Why were people ashamed of him? The Jewish people were looking for the Messiah who had come riding into Jerusalem, not on a donkey, but on a war horse with a shield and a sword. They didn't want a conqueror to come and get rid of the Romans who spoke about dying. And so sadly they were ashamed. The reference to the return of Christ there is not the return of Christ for the church. You won't have time to be ashamed of his return, because these mortal bodies are put on immortality. And how long will it take? In the twinkling of a second, it says in 1 Corinthians 15. This is Christ returning in judgment. And these people around Jesus who had the opportunity and yet failed to believe in who he was will face the judgment in the day to come. When Jesus carried his cross up to Golgotha to be crucified, no one was thinking of the cross as a symbol of a burden to carry. To a person in the first century, the cross meant one thing and one thing only, death in the most brutal fashion, painful and humiliating way. Were they overly worried about it? No. Are they still worried about it today around the world as they face persecution and death on a daily basis? No. Paul speaks about it in Romans 8, the condition of things there where they're being put to death. And he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril 
or sword as it is written for your sake we are killed all day long we are all accounted as sheep for the slaughter yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us a marvelous verse i've never been anywhere near the persecuted to death i don't know what it's like i've got some ridicule and all the rest of it but the lord gives them strength to face death face to face for his sake Peter went told in the of Book of Martyrs, asked to be crucified upside down because he was not worthy to be crucified in the same way as his Lord was. Therefore, take up your cross and follow me means willing even to die in order to follow Jesus. This is the ultimate meaning of denying yourself or dying yourself. It's, called, it's a call to absolute surrender to the control of the Lord Jesus Christ. And although the call is tough, its reward is absolutely priceless. Following Jesus is easy when everything's going smoothly. Our true commitment to Him is revealed, though, when we undergo trials. Jesus assured us the trials will come to his followers and he made no bones of it. Discipleship demands sacrifice and he didn't hide that cost. The scripture records in James 1 and 2 4, count it all joy, my brothers. All joy? No, you're kidding. No, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Obviously, they didn't know about bad facts in those days. Well, yes, they did. Well, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. No matter what the trial of tribulation is, that is God's plan and ultimate and purpose for each and every one of us. Further on in Luke 9, 57 and 62, we won't go into it. There are three people who seem to be willing to offer to walk with Jesus and follow him. But one wanted to go and bury his father. One wanted to say goodbye to his family. Nothing wrong with that, is it? Perfectly acceptable, perfectly reasonable. But Jesus is emphasizing in an emphatic way the importance and cost of discipleship that will be involved in following him. I came across these sayings the other day that impressed me. It says, if you wonder if you are really taking up your cross, consider these questions. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing some of your closest friends? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means alienation from your family? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means the loss of your reputation? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means the loss of your job? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means the loss of your life? In many places in the world today, it's still a reality. But most of the questions are phrased, are you willing? Following Jesus doesn't mean to say all these things will necessarily happen. But we are to take up our cross daily, even to the point of being willing to die for the sake of Him. There comes a point in your life where you're faced with a choice, Jesus or the comforts of this life, which will you choose? I don't know whether John and Joan had a pushy life in the Middle East or back here, but I think it might have been more public back here, I imagine. Following Jesus, what would Jesus do? Always follow that example. It's what true discipleship is about. And Jesus, in a way, metaphorically, took up his own cross in his life before taking it up in that physical fashion, which we've observed this morning. What did he do? He took up his cross and denied himself, and his temptations never resulted in sin. Not in word, not in thought, and not in deed. Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. As a man, he was totally dependent upon his Father. 
that it is also written that he offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. This is what it takes to faithfully take up your cross daily. You have to cry out to your God for the strength to hold out, for the strength to say no, and keep saying no in times of temptation. You must humble yourself and have the same mind that Jesus had. Not my will, but your will, Lord, be done in my life daily. Taking up your cross leads to a transformation. You won't always be the same person you are today. As you are cleansed from the sin of your sinful nature, the fruits of the Spirit come in its place. Rather than be quick to judge and critical or grumpy, and I'm glad it almost downstairs, and downcast, you can radiate love and kindness and gentleness. It will truly transform your life. We have the next scripture, please, in the 1 Corinthians 15, 31. And the title is, if it's another cheerful one, Die Daily. It says, I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. So the past is trying to make a or the Sanhedrin leader. He could have been a fancy Pharisee and he could have been a ruler in Jerusalem. He would have had a tremendous religious career. But when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, that was no longer thought of. He was also a qualified tent maker. He could have set up business shops wherever he went. And then a millionaire. He could have got married, he could have had children, he could have done all sorts of things, but his life was surrendered to serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever situation we are in, may our lives be surrendered, given over to Him on a daily basis. Paul said, I do not count my life of any value, nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. How wonderful that is. When Paul said, I die daily, he reminded the church that he faced the possibility of death every time he went somewhere new. He was beaten up and left for dead. He was shipwrecked three times. And yet he was able to say, My grace, your grace, is sufficient for me. The Bible proved that time and time again, in times of testing, in times when I've been struggling to be here, that God's grace is sufficient. It is even more than sufficient to meet our daily needs. Paul considered himself to be crucified with Christ. And therefore he could say, Oh, imitate me even as I also am of Christ. Could I stand here this morning and tell you to imitate me? I really sort of hesitate. I prefer you to find somebody better. But Paul was so Christ like you could say, imitate me even as I also am Christ. Paul wrote about dying to sin in the flesh. And he urged believers everywhere to imitate him. He was able to impact untold millions for the kingdom of God because he refused to be distracted and consumed by the earthly interests. Not even death scared him, so he could not be threatened away from obeying Jesus. We too can say, I die daily. Paul was totally sold out to God, and we can do sin. The flesh in this world will continually buy for our attention and demand our participation. But when we die daily, we consider ourselves unable to respond to those temptations. Moses chose to suffer, Moses chose rather to suffer affliction along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin. Because Paul was looking for the reward that is to come, a reward that is far greater than any reward you can possibly hope to have on this earth. Sorry, that was Moses who spoke about looking for the reward, not Paul. I caught a look on John's eye and I thought, well, I thank you, God. 
talk to you later. Talk to you later. I like we talk to you Dying to self. You know, that really would get rid of the problem of spiritual pride. Some of us tend to think we know everything and everyone must agree with us. It caused an enormous amount of trouble. But I love the words of Micah 6 verse 8. We have shown you, O oh man, what is good. But what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. One you spoke about that a while ago. I still remember it. Walking humbly with your God. The final scripture, and I'm going to say very little about this, is in Acts 17 verse 11. It is the church at Berea. This is not a commandment from God to do this day, but what the church willingly out of love for the Lord did. It says they have received the word of all readiness and search the scriptures how often? Daily. You find out whether these things are so. Don't take my word for it. See, John can give me a little eye and I suddenly realise I've made a mistake. But come up and tell me later if I'm wrong. Search the scriptures daily. It's a lifetime. You're never exhausted. They're inexhaustible. They're a treasure trove of information. Good to have our daily devotions, isn't it? But it's even more marvellous to study God's Word. You know, we don't study end times much, John's taught us. Just a fact. The third word of the book of Revelation is a promise of a special blessing to those who hear and who do the words in that book. And yet we largely ignore it because we think it's too hard. It's not. If I can understand it, sort of, anyone can. And John's taught it and it was good. There are other things we should do daily, but they're not called daily. What about rejoicing? Rejoice always. And again I say rejoice. What about praying? Well, once a day, isn't it? No. Pray without ceasing. What about giving thanks? In everything, give thanks. Even in persecution, trials, or bad backs, or I can't remember what it is in a bad back this way. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for us. Daily. Have you spell Sunday? S U N D A Y? No, that's a pagan Roman name. Let's call it S O N D A Y and let's call it that day, every day, as we daily seek to serve, to love, and to honour Him. We wake up in the morning, we have another precious gift from the Lord, another opportunity for serving, and that will walk away with Him motivated by love alone. We sing that chorus here up in Paramount every day. The final part it says, I give all that I am to you, that everything I could be a light that shines your name. Tomorrow we attend the funeral of Gavin Curry. You know Gavin, he comes here with silver hair, the Scottish voice, he comes from the Gideons. I know him personally, a wonderful man. Cheryl knows his wife, Joy. He's been called home to be with the Lord. He was a real estate agent. He could have devoted all his time into that paid more money. But he was absolutely committed to serving the Lord through the giving. He's a very gifted preacher and teacher. A wonderful man. And yet he's been called home to glory. And he is in the presence of his Saviour, rejoicing, not daily but eternal. And our time will soon come and we shall be forever with the Lord. In the meantime, let us serve Him today. Father, I just thank you that you have spoken to my heart about the importance in this one single word. That our lives are to be used in service for you every single day of our lives. 
We just pray for those who are mourning this morning for mention those who have been filled in disasters. But I pray for Joy as she attends her husband's funeral tomorrow. Father, strengthen her, encourage her in a mighty way of pray. We thank you for our brother's faithful service and that he is absent from the body and present with the Lord, which is ever so much better. And soon, very soon, we shall be with him there in the Lord's presence forever. So strengthen us, help us, enable us as we walk day by day that we might be found pleasing in your sight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And I apologize, I've grown